the new BitBoy version 2 is a palm-sized emulation handheld that attempts to harken back to the look of an original DMG Game Boy. This device features a 2.4-inch IPS screen, has SD card support, and thanks to some skilled developers, now has access to a number of extra emulators and ports than were originally available in its stock firmware. It boasts a solid combination of features, portability, and price, but is it really up to snuff as a pocket-sized all-in-one emulation handheld? Let's find out. To understand the context with which we'll be examining this device, we have to look at the history of the project and how it got to this point. The first model of the BitBoy is what they call a Famaclone, a device preloaded with hundreds of NES games, sort of like those 100-in-1 bootleg cartridges that you might find at a flea market in the 90s. Of course, these were always plagued with crapware to the point that you'd really only find a handful of games worth playing among the list, and unfortunately, the old BitBoy fell into these same pitfalls. Comically, the device even had an SD card slot on the physical mold, but there was no slot actually installed on the hardware, so it just left this useless opening on the case. As silly as this might be, it also demonstrates that the team may have originally been thinking ahead about expanded features on the device, and as such, we really wouldn't have to wait very long for the new BitBoy to replace this thing. While the old BitBoy came in several different flavors, the new BitBoy version 1 opted for the new DMG Game Boy look that would continue to be featured on the new BitBoy line of devices. The stock firmware on this device came bundled with three different emulators for NES, Game Boy, and Game Boy Color, all under the MiU banner of emulator software. You'll find a lot of different reviews on YouTube from this stage of the game, where most people will tell you that the NES emulation is pretty good, but the Game Boy and Game Boy Color suffer from visual inconsistencies and lack of any battery save support. It wouldn't be all that long before custom firmware was developed for the device, and a new version 2 hardware revision would start to be shipped, this transition happening during the early months of 2019. This hardware revision swapped out the mushy start and select buttons for a more clicky, responsive feel, but even more importantly allowed for reliable installation of the new custom firmware on the device through flashing an image file to the SD card. This is the device that I own and is most current as of this video, though I have seen some images teasing a possible future revision of the handheld, which, if real, would be a complete departure from the current form factor. Before I get into all the software and emulator features of the custom firmware, I just want to mention quickly that I do not condone copyright infringement through the illegal use of ROM files. I would instead encourage you all to look up free homebrew games, maybe dump your own ROMs off of your own cartridges, or seek out legal ways of digitally acquiring ROMs, such as the Python method for extracting ROMs from the Mega Man Legacy Collection on PC. My usage of emulation and ROMs in this video is for educational purposes only. Using custom firmware on the new BitBoy means you're probably going to have to become familiar with the G-Menu 2X front end, a general use menu system for similar types of emulation handhelds, and one that was originally developed for the Korean exclusive GP2X handheld from 2005. This front end is still commonly found today on these kinds of devices, and it allows for customizable skins, sections, and shortcuts to your various games, programs, and emulators. If you drop something new to load up in the main partition of the SD card, you can create a clickable shortcut to it in any section, and most packages that you download will come with an icon file if that doesn't already load up automatically when you create your shortcut. Powering off with the power option in the system section is advisable when you're using this custom firmware because if you just use the physical switch to power down without closing out everything and you have software still running, that can be known to corrupt or even lose some of your data including save states. Custom firmware on the BitBoy comes with a welcomed expansion of emulators from the stock MiU firmware including support for Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Boy Advance, PlayStation, and several other retro systems. 
you'll find a laundry list of open source ports in the next section, including OpenTyrian, which I reviewed in another video. Provided that you have the correct files for certain games like Doom and Quake, these will also run excellently for you on this little device. You can even add your own custom open BOR games, provided that their graphics can be scaled down to fit the very low screen resolution of the BitBoy. Thanks to Steward and the team's commendable development skills, you can even add some new stuff, including classic arcade games through MAME for All. It's important to understand that this version of the firmware is still in beta and going through constant updates but I would currently say that it's in a presentable state with an expansive suite of available software. This all sounds great, right? A cheap handheld gaming device that plays all the retro games that you want? The features are certainly expanded from the stock MiU firmware, but is the grass really greener on the other side? Let's start with the basics, that being the NES emulator FCEUX and the Game Boy emulator Oboy featured in the new custom firmware. Most people who purchased a new BitBoy were expecting a device that plays NES and Game Boy games in a small, portable form factor. In my opinion, these same people will still find a good experience with these 8-bit systems on the custom firmware side of things, though it may not be the right fit for everyone. Both emulators allow for full customization of controls, which is definitely a bonus on this device, reasons for which we'll get into in a bit. Video scaling options are available through the emulators, as opposed to the awkward and somewhat limited set of options available with the stock firmware. Oh boy lets you extensively customize palettes, even giving you the option to overlay Game Boy Color games with that original green monochrome palette, if you're into that sort of thing. I've seen comments online mentioning that there can be some inconsistent frame rates using the FCUX emulator for NES. When you directly compare certain games with both the MiU and FCUX emulators, there may be a noticeable difference between the smoothness of the frame rates. Additionally, the BitBoy custom firmware as a whole seems to be hampered by diagonal screen tearing issues based on the orientation of the scan lines. Developers have stated that this is a driver issue that can eventually be fixed, and though it's easily visible on camera, you most likely will only notice this in person when the screen is flashing or updating large amounts of pixels at the same time. In my opinion, these issues can slightly affect the visual smoothness, but there isn't any noticeable slowdown or input latency that would truly make things unplayable. It's up to you to decide if these issues are too much to handle on the BitBoy custom firmware, and in general, if you're just looking to play NES and nothing else on this system, I'm gonna have to admit that MiU is going to be your best option, despite the inferior user interface. My version of the handheld supports dual booting into both the MiU operating system and the custom firmware, so there's always that to consider. Game Boy and Game Boy Color, on the other hand, are leagues better than anything that the MiU software can offer you, from visual options to the presence of battery safe support. Now let's move on and check out some of the other emulators featured on the custom firmware, those of various retro systems that in most cases will require more than two buttons. As we venture into this territory, we're going to start to see some of the major flaws with the new BitBoy that unfortunately may end up coloring your opinion about this device. As mentioned previously, you can currently play SNES, Genesis, GBA, and PlayStation games, but they've also added support for TurboGrafx-16, Atari 2600, Neo Geo, Master System, Game Gear via the Master System emulator, Wonder Swan, MS-DOS in a pretty limited capacity, and then finally certain 80s arcade titles. With some tweaking and fiddling, you should be able to get most of these games up and running on these systems, with the exception of PlayStation, the arcade stuff, MS-DOS, and to a lesser degree Super Nintendo, those four having relatively limited or low-end compatibility. This is great and all, but you're quickly going to notice when you start playing that there are certain hardware limitations of the BitBoy that are going to make certain games totally unplayable, 
largely including games that require four or more buttons. Now, I don't claim to be much of a hardware guy, so try to bear with me here, but in layman's terms, the BitBoy was designed in a way to play games that only use an A and a B button through that stock MiU operating system. So, the printed circuit board that receives the button inputs on the BitBoy is wired in a way that creates these unwanted ghost inputs when pressing certain combinations of buttons that were not originally intended by the manufacturer. Simultaneous pressing of adjacent turbo and non-turbo buttons with a directional input at the same time is going to give you a pretty good chance of experiencing one of these ghost inputs. The new BitBoy's custom firmware does include some emulators that allow for custom controls, which can help to mask the defect at times, but this feature is currently missing in others like the main GBA emulator, GPSP. This creates problems in countless games like in platformers like Wario Land 4 if you happen to press down A and B at the same time while running and jumping, or here in Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance where you press right A and B at the same time and that triggers a select press that opens up the map while you're jumping. Now of course the developers can fix this emulator and probably will at some point in the future, possibly even by the time you see this video. Uh, but unfortunately with the BitBoy, you can only fix so much. Certain games like fighting games where you're going to be pressing the, the directional input and buttons quite a bit, quite frequently, frantically, you are eventually going to run into this problem, regardless. It's important to understand the limitations of this device, especially now that it's been confirmed that new units are shipping with the custom firmware pre-installed, forgoing that old MiU OS entirely. In the right context, I think the new BitBoy version 2 is an excellent little retro emulator device that I plan to continue using. The shrunken scale of the device makes it portable and appealing, the screen looks gorgeous most of the time, the buttons feel great, and the development team behind the custom firmware seems to be diligent and timely with their updates, constantly working to improve the experience and adding as much functionality as possible. In its price range and niche, you pretty much can't do any better than this. But at the same time, its technical limitations and design oversights lead to an experience that effectively walls off a large portion of prospective users from being able to enjoy the full potential of the device. If you're just looking for a cheap device to play 8-bit games on the go, the new BitBoy is for you. If you're a patient, technical-minded individual who enjoys retro games and doesn't mind doing a little bit of tinkering, heck, even gets some enjoyment out of it, the new BitBoy is definitely for you. If you're looking for a cheap entry point into a DIY electronics project, you can fix the ghost key problem, short battery life, lack of any L and R buttons, and other issues with some careful hardware modding. However, if you don't fall into any of those categories but still want a competent retro gaming handheld, I sadly don't think I can recommend the new BitBoy in its current state as emphatically as I had originally hoped. Especially if you're a stickler for emulation accuracy or are easily confounded by frequent glitches. The BitBoy line of devices appears to be moving awfully quickly through development, and it may not be very long before we see a version 3 of the handheld if those prototype pictures are to be believed. There's also a new clone handheld on the block, that being the recently released LDK game handheld, that is slightly more expensive than the new BitBoy and snubs that nostalgic Game Boy aesthetic for its own distinct look. Early reviews would suggest that this is a much more capable, approachable handheld than the BitBoy, but if this saga has taught me anything, it's that patience is key. This clone handheld race is likely to heat up as these devices gain more notoriety, and who knows, maybe if the popularity of this trend skyrockets, we'll eventually see an official Game Boy Classic or something similar from Nintendo. Anyways, I hope that this video has helped you make a more informed decision about whether or not the new BitBoy is right for you. If you want to find out more about this handheld, I definitely recommend hopping into the Retro Game Handhelds Discord to be up to date on the latest news about the BitBoy and other devices like it.
You'll discover more information and expertise there than I could ever cram into a YouTube video, and I'll be sure to include a link below somewhere for you guys. Maybe I'll do an update on this video at a later date when things have evolved, but for now, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you all next time.